um, welcome everyone to this, the first meeting of the Public Petitions, the Petitions Committee in 2018. I hope everyone had a, a good break and want to wish everyone all the best for the new year. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? And we've had apologies um, from Brian Whittle today. The first item on our agenda is evidence in Petition 1627 on consent for mental health treatment for people under 18 years of age. As members know, this petition was lodged by Annette McKenzie. We last considered the petition on 7th of December 2017, where we took evidence from Penumbra, the Scottish Association for Mental Health and Children in Scotland, to explore support available to people under 18 years of age who experience and seek treatment for mental ill health. This morning, we will be taking evidence from Maureen Watt, Minister for Mental Health, Ruth Christie, Head of Early Interventions, Mental Health and Protection of Rights Division, the Scottish Government, and Dr John Mitchell, Principal Medical Officer and Psychiatric Advisor for the Scottish Government. Can I welcome you all to the meeting this morning? Um, members have a range of questions to assist us in understanding the support that can be offered to young people who experience mental health difficulties. However, before we get to our questions, I'd like to invite the Minister to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, members. Firstly, I'd like to start by offering my sincere condolences to Brittany's mother, Annette McKenzie, and all her family and friends. Any death by suicide is a tragedy, which has a devastating impact on family, friends, and communities. And I think it's testament to her daughter that Ms McKenzie has raised these important issues in her petition for consideration by the committee. And I thank all those who have given evidence. Before we start discussing the detail of the petition, I'd just like to set out that mental health is a priority for this government. Our 10-year mental health strategy was published on the 30th of March, and it sets out our vision to improve mental health in Scotland. There are a number of actions in the strategy aimed at ensuring that children and young people have good mental health and that agencies act early enough when issues emerge and impact young lives. Early intervention and prevention is the cornerstone of our approach to mental health and well-being. Mental health needs to be something that everyone talks about, and reducing stigma and promoting discussion and early action are vital to ensuring that Scotland is the best place to grow up for our children and young people, especially this year, 2018, the year of young people. Any suicide is a tragedy with a deeply distressing impact on family and friends left behind. We are currently developing a new draft suicide prevention action plan. The draft action plan will be published for comment in spring 2018 and will be supported by a short series of public engage engagement events which are currently being planned. And we will publish the final action plan later in 2018. I agree with the views that committee members have expressed and with others that have given evidence, including the Scottish Youth Parliament, that young people have a right to confidentiality when seeking medical advice and to make informed decisions about consent. To change the current system may deter children and young people from seeking help from doctors and other professionals and may make them less likely to disclose the full facts of how they are feeling and their symptoms. This is the case across a range of physical and as well as mental health conditions and must continue. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Okay. Thank you very much um, for that. Can I start off maybe by exploring um, the Scottish Government's views around the prescription of antidepressants? I think antidepressants, I think, in uh, your evidence. Um, to, so the prescription of antidepressants to under 18s we suggested this is an, indicate, an indicator of an increase in the number of younger people seeking help with their mental health, and that was seen as a positive thing. Um, and while I think we will support people of all ages becoming more comfortable seeking assistance with mental health as they would be for their physical health, are you content that the rise in prescription of antidepressants represents young people receiving the appropriate treatment? Uh, yes, Convener, we are of the view that the rising uh, prescribing in Scotland is associated with the reduced stigma and more people coming forward for treatment and antidepressants are effective and evidence-based and there's currently no evidence that GPs um, are over-prescribing uh, antidepressants. 
Um, in 2014, I think, John, you read a, sh a Scottish Government short life working group of experts who concluded um, that the rise in prescri prescribing of antidepressants in Scotland is for the most part explained by better diagnosis and treatment of depression by GPs. Um, I think the time, John, that maybe you can go into that. But this is also in line with prescribing in general for physical illnesses too, um, that in all areas of health, uh, physical and mental, um, there are higher prescribing rates. But I don't know if you want to add anything, John. The, um, the, the document was published in the Scottish uh, Government website and it's called Key Information on the Use of Antidepressants in Scotland. And, and the reason that it was written was um, to explore the rising uh, prescribing of antidepressants at a time when we were moving from a performance target which was looking at antidepressant prescribing to one to do with psychological therapies. So an expert group was convened to look into this and um, the, the conclusions are, are available online but the um, the uh, evidence from a variety of sources uh, showed that, uh, as far as we know in Scotland, prescribing of antidepressants, uh, particularly by GPs, is appropriate. In particular, there was a study of uh, a million new prescription of antidepressants by Scottish GPs um, that showed that, that generally these were being uh, used for the right indications and they were actually being reviewed. Uh, so, um, as the Minister said, um, the Audit Scotland did an investigation into prescribing in Scotland and found a 30% increase in prescribing of all medications. Um, so the rise in antidepressants is, is really symptomatic of more people being treated for, uh, for depression. Surely, even in your own evidence, it's been said that um, it, it, young people shouldn't be prescribed um, antidepressants at a first visit until everything else has been exhausted. Are we seeing this a 30% increase in the prescription of antidepressants after all of that work has been done? The 30% increase was in all medications for all conditions across all ranges, so physical and mental health conditions. Um, but, the, but for antidepressants, there, there has been a, a rise in antidepressant prescribing at a population level. The numbers for children and adolescents are very much smaller, but there has been a, a consequential rise in, in the same time. But um, it's it run in parallel with the rise in people coming forward for treatment. Um, the, it, and um, I, I, you know, I should say that uh, antidepressants are, are certainly not the first line treatment for depression so in children. That. We've got figures to show that all visits to um, a GP by young people, at the point at which they are prescribed antidepressants, is when, on average. Uh, we don't have figures. We, so we, we don't, don't have figures. So we about don't know that. that. No. We, we 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 only know that, as you say, more people are presenting with issues around mental health, and there's an increase in antidepressants. We don't know whether there's a... Um, actually, it's not first protocol or last protocol. Would that be something the Scottish Government be willing to look at? We, we, we don't have those numbers. Uh, we've spoken to the Royal College of General Practitioners who would say that uh, GPs, uh, that the, the, at the very back of their mind, would be any prescribing uh, if a young person was coming forward with mental health problems. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's what they have told us. But, but we know that in this case, the young person was prescribed uh, tablets at the very first visit. Um, so we don't know, and we don't, you know, obviously we want to look at the, the general practice. We want to know what the, the routine approach of GPs is, but we do not know. You have said there's an increase, um, people are willing to talk about mental health issues. There's an increase uh, prescribing of antidepressant drugs, but we do not know whether that's at the end of a long process or at the beginning of the process. Would that concern you? If, it was, if there were evidence that at the first visit to a GP, a young person was routinely be getting antidepressants prescribed to them? Well, um, if I can just say, I mean, there's no evidence that having greater access to uh, psychological therapies will reduce antidepressant prescribing. Um, you know, I think we've got to just talk in the generalities here. We don't know what conversation there was between the person uh, the petitioner's daughter um, and what state she was in. So, you know, if you went for anything, if, if the doctor thought the first off that, that the, the person was in such a state that they needed 
antidepressants plus psychological therapies, which are not going to happen that day. If it was a combination of the both, you, you wouldn't wait to start one without, you know, while waiting for you wouldn't for the other. Um, that, that kind of thing. At one level, we, of course, we can't second guess the clinician and if a young person was in crisis. But within our own evidence, it suggested to us that good practice is that you don't prescribe initially, that you do it after everything else has um, been tried and you, you move on to that. I'm just concerned that you seem to be seeing a correlation in a positive way by increased prescription of antidepressant drugs and better attitudes to mental health when it could equally represent poor medical practice in that um, a young person is routinely given antidepressants at their first visit. Would you be willing to maybe investigate this question about your um, the, where the policy, I think the policy intent is right, it is, is explicit that it ought not to be happening routinely. Would you be willing to explore that? Well, well, as I said, the publication I, I mentioned earlier, which was in the British Journal of General Practice, um, that was in 2012, and that looked at uh, new courses of antidepressants being prescribed in Scotland. The figures that we've been given, which indicate or are presented as being showing that we've a better positive attitudes to mental health because there's a higher levels of prescribing. Um, it, uh, well, it, it, that research happened, and the, the research that's described in the 2014 report happened because of the rise in prescribing and because of the, the concerns that people had expressed. OK. Um, Michelle? OK, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I, want, I want to pick up on, on the thread that Joanne's been following here um, in terms of appropriate treatment. Um, and I hear what you're saying, and I, I certainly will go and have a look at that research, because often with research it depends what the questions were that were asked, obviously. So if you're asking GPs, you know, are you making all the considerations, are you following the NICE guidelines, then it will say yes. Um, but the question I, I want to to explore with you is, is how does the government ensure that GPs do have adequate training, um, particularly to support young people with mental health generally, and including making prescription decisions to ensure that young people are, are properly informed of the side effects um, and the, the real, I suppose, meaning of informed consent? Because what we do know from the recent audit of suicides is the majority of young women actually overdose. Um, that's their... their first line of choice and you know I think this is a, a really important issue and certainly one that Joanne was exploring there so so what evidence you have what confirmation can you give us that, that there is adequate training for GPs around this all uh, GPs are fully registered medical practitioners who've completed undergraduate psychiatry the Royal College of GP figures show that over 75% of the current total of GP trainees in Scotland have completed postgraduate psychiatry posts, and over 50% have worked in children in paediatrics, and around 30% will have done both. So the GPs who are coming through the system have a good level of knowledge and experience of mental health issues, um, as well as paediatrics. And we know that one in three presentations to primary care have a mental health element. So therefore, GPs are very experienced in consideration of the mental health and well-being of their parent of their patients. Um, also, GPs um, must undertake 50 hours of continuous prevent uh, continuous professional development uh, every year. Um, and the Royal College of GPs has a free e-learning. Um, online e-learning modules in a variety of topics which include uh, child and adolescent mental health and depression in children and young people. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists, NICE and NHS Education Scotland for Scotland also have resources available. So all the training um, modules, all the training um, evidence is there for GPs to access. I, I don't think that there is any evidence that GPs are not as uh, well versed in mental health issues as any other issue at all. But I don't know if you want to add anything, John. GPs are expert medical generalists. Um, and as the Minister said, they've, they've followed a general 
undergraduate medical training, which has involved psychiatry, the training for a GP, for all GPs, would, um, as part of the curriculum, have information in it about communication, about family dynamics, and information about children and mental health. But in terms of specific specialist knowledge, um, as the Minister said, um, the, actually the vast majority of current GPs have done postgraduate psychiatry, uh, as well as doing their GP training. Um, the, um, the, the Minister has explained the, the revalidation um, for doctors in the United Kingdom, which requires all doctors um, to do continuing professional development. And uh, those 50 hours of continuing to professional development are a mixture of mandatory training and also uh, individual bespoke training depend dependent on what the needs of the individual are. There's an annual appraisal meeting that every doctor has where there's an opportunity for that doctor to talk to their appraiser about what training they have done uh, in the last year and also what training might be appropriate for them to do. Have, have any concerns ever been raised with you that GPs are not adequately trained in mental health and, um, and that GPs need to know more about non-pharmacological um, options? Has, has that ever been brought to you at all? I mean, we are aware of uh, parliamentary questions and ministerial correspondence that has expressed concerns about that. But talking to the Royal College of General Practitioners and talking to uh, primary care advisors in government, um, the the GPs themselves say that mental health and mental health issues are really very important to them. Uh, they, they take a keen interest and, and they, are, they, they work hard to make sure that there is training available and that they are up to, to date with it. Um, the uh, Royal College of General Practitioners would, would, would be saying um, that uh, if a young person was presenting with a mental health problem, um, that prescribing would be at the very last bit of their, their head, that the first thing that they would be doing would be thinking about the social environment and family environment that child was in um, and, and thinking uh, think about what are the community um, opportunities you know, to, to try and reach out and help that child, um, including potentially referring uh, to specialist services and including the provision of psychological therapies. Um, G GPs, you know, have said to me from the Royal College of GPs that they, they wouldn't default to prescribing, um, you know, that they, they would be very, uh, I, 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 they wouldn't do that. But, but as, as you identified earlier, you don't have figures that, that show us that, which I think is, is one of the challenges we have, um, because most of that sort of evidence is anecdotal rather than evidence-based, which I think is something you know we may need to look at going forward. Um, can, I, can I just ask finally around safeguarding? Um, in amongst all this mandatory training and, and, and optional training around CPD, where does safeguarding fit? Is that a mandatory annual renewal or biannual renewal? Um, the um, mandatory arrangements vary from place to place. Um, the, uh, the, the, the safeguarding, um, the, the fundamental um, risk assessments that doctors do on all sorts of issues and the fundamental issues to do with confidentiality and consent that are, are part and parcel of really all clinical encounters are something um, that doctors know um, is really instructed by the GMC uh, in terms of its, uh, its uh, what's laid out and the principles of, of good medical practice. Um, so the, 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 there, there will be there will be places where there are aspects of it that are mandatory and places that there, are, there aren't. But generally, mandatory training, they try, in primary care, they try to have as little as possible to allow as much space for the individualistic training that's required. And, and most of the mandatory training tends to be on issues as like fire safety, um, on uh, child protection um, and on um, things like uh, information government governance and uh, hand washing and, and, and health and uh, health and safety issues. Um, so the, uh, the 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 principles of the GMC would really be the overarching uh, way for that would guide doctors in terms of safeguarding and managing risk and thinking about consent and capacity. Right, so if you, you know, for, for most professions in terms of breaking confidentiality, for example, around um, escalating of information for a, a youngster that's considered to be vulnerable at risk, 
Um, how is that then communicated? How is that training? Because obviously there's been significant changes from, from the rules around child protection to the term of safeguarding and the manner in which that is escalated and, and the, the sharing of information, which has been a massive point of discussion. So, so how is that training? How is that now communicated? And, and how do doctors, GPs particularly, um, engage in that? So there's um, GMC guidance um, on this. and. Um, uh, on confidentiality, um, the guidance says respecting patient confidentiality is an essential part of good care. This applies when the patient is a child or young person, as well as when the patient is an adult. Without the trust that confidentiality brings, children and young people might not seek medical care and advice, and they might not tell the doctor all the facts needed to provide um, good care. So, on disclosure, the GMC guidance makes it clear that Disclosure without consent is only permitted if there's an overriding public interest. For example, if there's someone who drives a vehicle um, and that they, they may have, you know, experiencing blackouts or something like that. There's a, as we know, there's a, um, you have to tell the uh, DVLE. Um, and in, when it's in the best interests of the patient uh, who doesn't have the maturity or understanding to make a decision, um, so, for a, a child diagnosed with a seal, serious illness like cancer, for example, the GP um, would inform parents and carers uh, because they would need treatment and support. And when it is required by law, for example, for child protection uh, reasons like child, child abuse. Um, but all this was as a result of the, um, uh, the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991. Um, when people uh, are considered adults over the age of 16. I was just as a comment, and then I'll obviously come off. Um, when a child or a young person is likely to take their own life, under normal circumstances, that would count as the need to disclose for every other profession. And, and that's, I suppose, the nub of the question for us here. When, for a GP, does that become a need to disclose? Because Certainly, as a professional, um, you know, I, I worked in children's services as a nurse. I was duty bound to disclose when I felt a child was potentially at risk of taking their own life. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I would. I would completely agree. I, I mean, yeah. I think. Um, I think any clinician who. Uh, you know, believed that the person in front of them was expressing active suicidal ideas. Mm. That 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 level of risk would trump any concerns about confidentiality. Can I just also add, perhaps, uh, convener, um, that you know, whole direction of travel uh, in Scottish government, uh, when you consider things like the uh, chief medical officer's uh, realistic medicine and realising realistic medicine, it's much more um, about now about a treatment um, and, and prescribing being as a result of a conversation between the patient and the. Um, and the medical practitioner rather than just maybe in days past when we would just expect that the doctor knew everything best um, and you know you just took what the doctor said I mean you know I, I can think of things when I've said no I don't want that thank you very much and uh, you know people now need to realize that they've got the thing the whole thing and about the relationship between the GP uh, and the patient now is more about having that conversation and I think that's the direction of, uh, of travel. You can't talk about specifics of individual case but you said if it was a general case if you imagine a person who's 16 years of age is in such crisis that you go against the usual assumptions that you wouldn't prescribe in the first visit, you would try other things, this would be um, a point of last resort. The person is prescribed on their first visit and yet they're deemed able to have a conversation as you describe it. Do you not think that's simply not what would happen in the real world? And that a young person in those circumstances is not in any co relationship with the, the doctor to start with, as by your definition, is in, is in such crisis they have to override all of these things and yet, it doesn't involve looking to how you said, if it were cancer, the family would be brought in and told in order to give support. But because it's a mental health issue, the family's not brought in. And at the nub of this case is that if the, the family had known, they feel they would have been able to support the young person better, even if it were simply to be 
um, the prescriber to manage the drugs for the young person. As you've said, convener, we don't know the circumstances in this case. We don't know if... In that, that, that imaginary case I'm describing, yeah, yeah. somebody's okay. in such crisis, they override all of the normal practice, which is last resort and all the rest of it. Surely, in those circumstances, it would, this theoretical example of somebody in such crisis, they're only 16 years of age, they've not got any correlationship with the doctor, they haven't been discussed this before, that... It, if, if you put a safeguard in for a cancer patient, why would you not put it in for a young person with mental health challenges? That are so, that are so severe, they're going against this normal practice of, of prescribing as a last resort. As I said, I, I don't think... Um, we, we don't know what went on in this specific case, and we can't surmise. Um, you know, there are obviously going to be an investigation I'm not asking you, I'm not asking you in, in respect, it, but... I'm what, not what, asking... Yes, I understand Minister, that. Minister, let me finish the point. I'm not... A, um, we're all very sensitive to the fact that um, this young girl's family probably are following this closely. So we're not talking about that specific case. And we, we've all got respect for that. We understand we don't know the individual circumstances. I'm asking you to think about a circumstance where a young person of 16, as you said, was in such crisis that they couldn't wait for the other therapies, that they had to be prescribed there and then. Do you seriously think that that is circumstance where you're going to have a conversation about what best meets your, need, meets your needs and why would you not, if you thought it appropriate for a cancer patient to ensure the family's round about them, that you wouldn't have family round about them when you're prescribing these drugs? I think we should also not assume um, that the young person is any less um, um, aware of what's going on than an older person. I mean, young people talk much more about mental health problems now than uh, we ever did before. But, um, John, you, do you want to take yeah. over? I was just saying, I think the, the principles of realistic medicine are about good communication, <laughs> about um, health between patients and, and clinicians. I, th I think um, that the specific uh, situation you're describing, which is, is one really of urgency and, uh, uh, and, and great concern, that I, I, I think... Um, I can only say it's urgent because the doctor in deciding in this theoretical example has overridden all good practice, which is you don't do it immediately, you try everything else first. There's almost a presumption against antidepressants. That's I, how serious it is in this theoretical example. If, if, the, the, the normal thing about let's have a conversation with this would surely not... It, it wouldn't... If you imagine yourself into those circumstances... Because yes. I'm not saying yes. it's that serious, but it must have been, or it must be, for you to override yes. all these policies. So the normal thing about let's have a conversation with this, would you accept that wouldn't apply? And what safeguards then would you put in place? I, I'm just, I suppose I'm just trying to understand what the situation would be. So if a young person presented to a GP for the first time and the nature of the conversation meant that the GP was immediately concerned, uh, you know, that the, the, this young person was actually severely mentally disordered or in severe distress or had a, a, a level of severe risk, a GP wouldn't say, I'm going to treat you with an antidepressant and do no more. A GP would recognise that risk and seek specialist help and support. And, and that might be available through an emergency referral to a child and adolescent mental health centre service, for example, um, but a, you know, there wouldn't, the, the, it wouldn't be that um, guidelines and processes would be breached or would be changed. A, a GP would just, um, would the level of concern would rise so that the GP would, would think, well, I'm not going to just manage this situation on my own. And I think certainly I can't imagine a clinical situation where any person presenting, a, a, you know, acutely distressed, potentially mentally ill, uh, potentially suicidal, would simply be given an antidepressant and, uh, and that would be that. So there, there would be much more um, concern and support put in place around somebody, uh, you know, done at, at a, an emergency that day um, uh, situation. And we know that happens routinely. Well, I, I mean, I see that happening in my own clinical practice. I mean, I, I, I've been working psychiatry for 25 years now and, uh, you, you know, would routinely be receiving referrals from GPs in exactly those situations of somebody presenting to them that they feel is a psychiatric emergency. OK, Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow on in the 
the issue of consent and confidentiality, because I think that's at the core of this petition. Um, the submission from the government mentioned um, a review of the consent process, and I wonder if you could provide me with an update of that review. The, as part of uh, realising realistic medicine, which was the 2015-16 the CMO annual report, um, the, uh, C, the chief medical officer announced that uh, working with the GMC and the Royal Academy of uh, Medical Colleges, that there would be a review of consent in Scotland. Um, and uh, that, that has been happening. Um, and the uh, intention is that the product of that review is going to be coming out for consultation in March. March of this year? Yes. Right, thank you. Um, just to follow on from that, um, one of the um, submissions from a Fiona French um, states that she, she doesn't believe the onus should be on the patient to give informed consent because by the very nature of it, you know, they're, they're at a vul very vulnerable um, time in their lives. If you magnify that into the, a, a young person of 16, you know, I, th I think, to be quite honest, when this petition first came to us, everyone on the committee was alarmed and shocked that a young person of 16 could be given strong drugs without anyone else's knowledge. So I wonder if I could have your view on that, um, aside from the, the guidelines. What, what do you feel about the fact that, you know, a young person of 16 was prescribed these drugs and do you think she'd have been capable of giving informed consent? I, well, again, I can't uh, talk about the individual circumstances of, of that case. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, I would agree with evidence that you've received from many other parties, such as the Youth Parliament and, and from professional bodies, that... Um, young people are able to give consent and informed consent about the treatment um, for various conditions. Uh, and in the same way that, uh, for example, a young person has a right to confidentiality on the prescription of, of contraceptives, um, a young person has the right to confidentiality for the treatment for medical conditions and for mental health conditions. We we don't know, um, we don't we don't know the circumstances of, of this, um, but the, the the situation was the child was prescribed a, a beta blocker medication, which um, isn't an antidepressant. Uh, it's a medicine that's used for other purposes. It's used in treating, um, uh, preventing heart disease and, and high blood pressure and maintains your pulse at a, a regular rate. Um, and, uh, it, you know, if that had child had been presenting for a, a physical health problem and had been prescribed a medicine like this, which is primarily a physical health medicine, um, then, uh, then a universal opinion would be that uh, children have the right to be able to um, uh, make those decisions with with their GPs. And and what the, again GPs have told me is that um, they routinely, in all circumstances, think about: is the young person in front of them capable? Do they have capacity to make the decision that they're that they're um, that they're weighing up? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think it is possible um, that young people are able to give informed consent, and I think uh, that should be still permitted. Okay, thank you. John? Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Um, good morning, everyone. If, if I could uh, perhaps broaden out the questioning uh, to turn to the issue of CAMS, which has uh, already been touched on uh, slightly. Um, we understand that the scope of uh, CAMS differs between NHS boards uh, and that this creates a risk uh, that some people may fall through the gaps in, in certain areas. Now, when we took evidence um, a few weeks ago, there was a suggestion made by uh, Sam H uh, to extend CAMS up to the age of 25 for those already uh, in the system and in the longer term to establish a specialist 16 to 25 service. Um, could I ask what your views are on that suggestion? Okay, so uh, we announced in the programme for government this year that we're committed to exploring uh, the potential flexibility of those aged 18 to 25 to continue their care and treatment um, within CAMS and um, work to explore the expansion of CAMS to age 25 is under development at the moment and that will form part of the remit 
of the Youth Commission led by Young Scott, uh, which we announced on the 6th of December. The young people involved in the Commission are going to do their own research, identify issues uh, that are important to them, speak to experts, policy makers and service providers to look at areas uh, for improvement and they will um, present recommendations. Uh, to ministers. So um, I think there's the general um, direction of travel will be to um, extend um, that specialist service of CAMS to age 25. Um, but I think uh, in my discussions, for example, on Monday this week with um, year five um, medical graduates who are doing uh, CAMS psychiatry, um, I think it, that flexibility needs to be in there because um, there are some children, and yesterday I was at the junction, um, for which is a, a, a youth project in Leith, um, meeting children, and one girl, for example, with an eating disorder, said that she wouldn't, um, you know, children with eating disorders may feel quite childlike um, and don't want to go on to adult therapy, so moving to 25 might be um, appropriate for them but other children maybe with anger management issues feel they're more adult and want to, uh, to move on. So I think that flexibility needs to be in the system, but I think we'll wait and see what um, the research shows. But that would be the general direction of travel. Okay, thanks. Um, am I correct in uh, understanding that there's to be an increase in funding to CAMS as part of the 10-year um, mental health strategy? I'm sure I saw that somewhere. Yes, um, the whole direction of travel in the mental health strategy is for early intervention and prevention. Um, so the, the uh, emphasis on children uh, and young people uh, is uh, there uh, as part of the uh, as set out in the draft budget. We intend to increase our debt direct support for mental health and innovation improvement uh, to 17 million. That's 30. 2% increase, and this includes the money for CAMS uh, transformation and our commitment to increase the mental health workforce by an extra 800 workers uh, over the next um, five years. Um, obviously, um, CAMS um, target lists have a, um, a very high profile, and as I've said on many occasions, I am not happy with those boards that um, don't meet their um, targets. We have the mental health uh, improvement team from uh, Health Improvement Scotland working with a number of boards to um, redesign their services if necessary, to upskill those already working uh, in CAMS and also to increase the number of people uh, working in CAMS and that work is ongoing. And I hope that it will um, show improvement. Uh, for example, in Forth Valley, where they, where they were one of the first boards um, to work um, with the health improvement team, we saw um, an immediate increase but in, in the number of uh, children being seen. And, um, and then uh, a couple of people left the team and they fell back again. So there's a fra fragility in the system that we need to work out. Okay, thanks. Um, with regard to Eight targets. So we know that CAMS is intended to be a, a four-tier system. Um, however, the stats and, and targets only exist for tiers three and four, um, which are the more intensive sectors. Um, th does the current data provide a, a comprehensive representation of mental health demand uh, for young people in Scotland? And if not, um, does the government have any plans to develop data in this area? would be extremely difficult to capture data uh, on tiers one and two because it's that service is provided over a wide range of organizations it could be in schools youth groups um, any, anywhere really so it's I think it would be quite difficult to capture that um, but um, you're absolutely right in your direction of que questioning that we want to make sure um, that children are given help at a very early stage um, rather than have to necessarily wait for tiers three and four. There will be, uh, as John said, people who need to, di to go directly into um, uh, tiers three and four, um, but um, 
by increasing the number of people who have, for example, mental health first aid training, um, if we can identify people who are showing signs of depress depression or, or distress and, and can um, have them have um, a, a sort of lower intensity counselling sessions earlier on, then we can perhaps prevent uh, the people having to, to go to, to tiers three. Um, and four, and that's why one of the other streams of work in the mental health strategy is the review of personal and social education in schools. Okay, thanks. With regard to, to help for children at an early stage, you'll, you'll probably be aware that uh, uh, the Scottish Youth Parliament noted its members favour an, an increased focus in social prescribing opportunities, uh, such as peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, talking to youth workers, information centres and counselling, either as an alternative or uh, to complement um, uh, medical interventions that are already uh, in place. W what's your view of these suggestions and uh, have you undertaken any work to, to develop these alternatives? Absolutely, and um, I think you know we're all on the, the same page in this. That's all, that, that is what we all uh, want to achieve. Um, and as I said, we're working very closely with youth groups um, to uh, take this forward. Okay. Uh, any examples of where it's happening already? Um, well, the Scottish uh, Youth Commission um, that, that I mentioned um, is, is part uh, of the work. There's um, work going on, for example, on rejected referrals, um, which is a, a piece of work being undertaken by Young Scott uh, and Sam H in conjunction. So um, they will collect statistical uh, data on rejected referrals, um, but also um, recruit um, young children to to uh, give us a, an idea of what their um, their journey has been uh, in this field. Um, and um, this is not something new because the previous mental health strategy also had uh, actions in this field. Um, and um, you know it's, it's ongoing work. We've got to just keep at it. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to add anything? Well, just to say that the, the the previous mental health strategy had a commitment in it about trying to improve uh, social prescribing opportunities, particularly as options uh, for primary care. Um, and as the minister said, the audit of rejected referrals is going to provide us with very rich data about uh, what happens to young people if they are not taken on by specialist uh, CAM services. So we, we will be getting a quite detailed landscape of the alternatives um, to specialist child and adolescent mental health, for example, the peer support and uh, other community um, agencies. Okay, thanks. And will you be looking at the um, reduction in support, for example, in a community setting or in a school setting? I mean, the Education Committee um, was out and about Monday and we had a number of focus groups and one of the groups that I was with were around uh, teachers. One of the things they, they spoke, probably was one voice on, was um, first the frustration and difficulty to get a CAMS referral, but at the same time that the sports within schools are reducing. I mean, I don't know whether there's been a conversation with the education department uh, about the importance not of reducing these, but increasing them. So um, we're working together with the education department on the review of PSE and in schools. And uh, on Tuesday night uh, in Parliament, uh, when uh, Sam H had their annual um, reception in Parliament. They launched their campaign um, of going to be to make sure that children and young people have that early access um, to uh, early intervention. <coughs> and um, as you know, we want, as I said previously, we want to make sure that a wide variety of people working within the education service and youth service have those skills to be able to identify people that are showing signs of anxiety and depression, um, but also if know where they can get counselling or know where to direct them to. And we have good examples of that happening in the country um, already. The one that perhaps you will have seen in the news uh, was Wallace High School in Stirling. Can I just clarify one thing with um, Dr Mitchell? You said that um, these beta blockers that were mentioned in the petition weren't antidepressant drugs, but is it the case, however, that they are 
um, seen as an anti-anxiety treatment for yes. mental health presentations. Do you want to give an idea of what the court uh, So it was it wasn't yes. a medic it wasn't a physical health problem. It's been the medication was being provided for. It was for a mental health issue. I, well, I'm I'm assuming that's the case. I don't know the the circumstances of of, of what happened. Um, but uh, propranolol is, as I say, it's primarily used. It's a beta blocker, primarily used for treating high blood pressure and for preventing heart attacks. Um, it is used in treating anxiety uh, because it has the symptomatic effect of holding your pulse at a steady rate. So, for example, um, if you knew you were going to have to um, come and uh, give evidence at a, a parliamentary committee and, and um, tachycardia or rapid pulse rate was something that was hugely problematic for you, then that might be something that you would use to um, keep your pulse at a steady rate to, to reduce that. So it, it, is, it is used in treating anxiety, but not used in treating depression. So if, if you were prescribing it, you wouldn't be prescribing it to somebody who is in crisis? Um, I, I wouldn't imagine so because it wouldn't have a. It doesn't have a um, an immediate function, just you know, beyond what I described in, as I say, reducing symptomatic feelings of rapid heart rate and therefore sub subjective feelings of anxiety. But it's not. It wouldn't be an emergency treatment, uh, except uh, in cardiac um, cardiac health. Okay, um, Michelle. Yes, thank you. Um, it's interesting because as we as we go through this, um, I must admit I, I sit here and I, I feel some discrepancies in what I see on the front line and and some of the commentary. Um, CAM services, for example, you know, have been reduced. Um, sort of where I've been working, but I mean, one of the things that we do know is that evidence um, it shows us that most mental health problems do begin in adolescence, and if they're not caught early do actually go on into adult life and cause tremendous problems. And during the evidence that we've taken so far, there have been quite a number of concerns raised that there isn't enough emphasis um, and clear emphasis on early intervention and tackling problems at adolescence level. Um, and I, I wondered how you, you would respond to that. Um, and I want to just wrap into that as well, the fact that when you look at signed guidelines, um, where the evidence we were given also suggested that only about half of GPs had actually indicated that they were familiar with the side guidelines um, around sort of mental health. And again, you know, that doesn't quite concur with some of what you've been saying around GPs' knowledge and understanding. So there does seem to be discrepancy in people's experience um, and some of the evidence from the, that we've been given so far and what you're saying. And I, I just wondered how you'd respond to that. I think in, in earlier answers, I think we've given you, I mean, we were talking earlier about anecdotal. We can't work on, on an anecdotal and, you know, John, as the mental health lead in the Scottish Government, gets a better picture overall and has more um, conversations with uh, GPs and people working in this field th throughout the country. So um, I think in terms of all the things that we mentioned in terms of previous uh, questions in relation to all the guidance that GPs have access to and the continuous professional um, development and the fact that one in three um, of people uh, presenting to GP practices will be with a mental health problem. Um, I think you know, GPs and health practitioners are well versed in, in dealing with that as they are uh, with physical health problems in terms of um, you're absolutely right um, that most mental health problems occur in uh, adolescence or even earlier, and that's why 14 of the actions in the mental health strategy uh, are concerned with early intervention uh, and prevention. And that's the key to minimising the prevalence of and incidence of poor mental health um, and the severity of the lifetime impact of poor mental health. I think it's also important to stress um, that recovery <coughs> is key and is possible in or managing the condition is key in um, most situations uh, uh, on mental health but you're absolutely right that early intervention and prevention is um, the but, what, what we must make sure that we do in terms of making sure that um, Scottish people can expect um, to live with good mental health and well-being. 
Can I just ask then, um, in terms of measuring the success of your strategy with an emphasis on early intervention, and um, Dr Mitchell, you said earlier you couldn't imagine a situation where a doctor wouldn't seek help um, when somebody was presenting in crisis and, and uh, uh, had suicidal tendencies, and, and you couldn't imagine that somebody would just prescribe as a result of that. Um, and when we know that GP appointments run for about 10 minutes, you know, that is the, the general allocated time. Um, and we also know that uh, a psychiatrist or psychologist wouldn't, wouldn't do a 10-minute appointment. Um, and we also know that, that mental health is not diagnosable by a test in the same way that a lot of physical illness is. So it is much more of a judgment call. So when you're looking at measuring the strategy, you said earlier that prescribing you saw as a positive indicator that people were seeking help. If your strategies work, do you expect them prescribing to plummet as an indication that your strategy has been successful? Because surely, if we're treating mental health effectively at an early interventional level, prescribing should disappear to a great extent. Um, the, uh, the success of our strategy will be about people being able to access the treatment that they need when they need it. And um, and the, and depression uh, happen can happen to anyone, um, and many mental illnesses um, may have a the, the, your your pre pre morbid mental health and your development is a significant uh, contributing factor. But mental illnesses can happen just de novo out of out of the air. So um, so you know for example your experience really as a child um, may not have any implication on whether you later develop schizophrenia or dementia or some other um, severe mental illness. Um, Men mental illnesses exist and uh, there are pharmacological and uh, psychological and social treatments for them that we know work. Um, and just like with physical illnesses where we would treat a physical illness with some medications that we know work, um, people, the, increasing the access of people to that treatment doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the use of medications and prescribing would fall. And, and we should think of a lot of mental illnesses just in the same way as we think, think of physical illnesses in that sense. So um, in terms of, I suppose, success in uh, people generally accessing all health and improving all health, we wouldn't expect to see that leading to a drop in the prescribing of all medications, nor should we expect that for mental health. Okay. Um, I mean, one of, one of the, I guess, the, the stumbling blocks or the difficulties for us exploring this, for you being grilled about it, and, and for the population in general, is how does a GP, when presented with a patient, particularly a young patient, make the decision between whether they're, what they're looking at is a, a clinical depression that may require pharmacological intervention, or a normal course of life, because everybody will suffer from depression at some point in life, I think you would probably agree. But for most people, they don't require pharmacological intervention. Um, and how do you make that decision when somebody walks into your surgery and talks about how they're feeling as to whether that is, is, is something that needs pharmacological intervention? And that, that's where I'm struggling slightly, and I'm sure my colleagues are, as to surely that, that requires much more investigative conversation um, to ascertain what, what kind of depression, what level of depression, and therefore what treatment that needs. And therefore, is it appropriate at GP level to be making that decision around pharmacological intervention? So we know that um, poor mental health and well-being uh, is related um, to poverty and deprivation, and that those living in poor communities are more likely to uh, experience mental health, uh, ill health, and and depression, and many of them just accept it as a way of life instead of coming forward. And we've got to make sure uh, that more people feel f uh, able to come forward in terms of living um, with poor mental health. But that's precisely why um, more GP practices are becoming multidisciplinary teams, and that's why we're expanding the link worker programme to sh make sure that there's a link worker in every um, uh, 
GP practice, uh, starting off with those in the deprived areas, so that the GP, once they have seen them, can, as you say, it might not, we, we've got to get to the root cause, and that is where the link worker will come in, have that longer conversation, and find out um, why people are feeling depressed um, and, and what the root cause is. That now, as John says, that's not, that doesn't mean to say that they shouldn't necessarily be prescribed, but also making sure that we're taking a holistic approach um, to people's condition and finding out how it can be helped in, in, in other ways. So it might be where the link worker makes sure that the person is receiving all their benefits um, or that their financial situation can be improved or um, you know, if there are signs of er early ch adverse childhood experiences um, that we can get to the root cause, of, which may be childhood sexual abuse or, or whatever, and then the person is given the right help in those areas. So yes, it is a multidisciplinary um, intervention that is required, but we should never forget um, that poverty and deprivation are a huge problem in terms of uh, people's ill health. I mean, I, I think what you say is absolutely right. I think um, uh, mental illnesses are difficult to diagnose because we can't do a blood test or do a brain scan to confirm to confirm them. And, and that's why there is a medical training um, uh, and, and a clinical training to, to allow people to identify those things. Um, uh, people presenting in distress who are unhappy or perceive them to be de de depressed, clinicians won't necessarily jump to thinking this is a diagnosis of clinical depression. Um, they they would uh, consider you know uh, the, the sort of social environment of someone, um, but to try to aid diagnosis, I mean it is generally understood, clinically understood, that there are some hallmark features of clinical depression, uh, which is more than just the pervasive lowering of mood, but with sleep disturbance, early morning wakening, a typical typical diurnal variation of mood being worse in the morning than in the evening, a change in concentration, a change in how we think to more pessimistic thinking. And those hallmark features are um, diagnostic characteristics that um, a GP would, would know in the same way that a GP would know that somebody presenting with joint pain, how they go about diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis, what would be the features that would point them towards a, a physical diagnosis. We, we do have some rating scales as well, I should say, that assist with that. So, for example, in uh, trying to screen for postnatal depression, you know, we, we nationally use uh, the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Rating Scale, which assists clinicians in being able to identify people who are above a threshold that is likely to then require a clinical intervention, which may not be a pharmacological intervention. Would you accept, would it be reasonable to say that identifying that in adolescence with all the, the issues around adolescence is more complicated than in a, a mature adult? Um, I, I think it is, yes. I, I think it requires a, um, a, a sort of sensitive understanding of what it's actually like being an adolescent nowadays and an understanding, I, I suppose, of, of the, de the developmental pathway that we all go through in terms of um, uh, growing into an identity of ourselves as a, as a, 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 and, a, a, you know, and, and that... Um, you know, on top of, I suppose, uh, the other hallmark features that I've described, yes, does require a certain degree of subtlety. And, um, and the, as I said, the, the conversations I had with the Royal College of General Practitioners around this, um, what they were saying was that, um, you know, they, they see people coming, turning to them in distress and turning to them in problems very routinely. Um, and uh, they are used to starting off by not thinking in a medical way, but thinking actually in a social environmental way to explore with people um, what the problems are in their life and what they can do about them without necessarily thinking about medical interventions and medical diagnosis. And do you think then, one last question, if, if the convener will bear with me, do you think therefore there is a gap in the sign guidelines, um, because in, in terms of the relation to dealing with adolescents with mental health coming to a GP, do you perceive a gap in the guidelines and, and a need for strengthening those guidelines and strengthening the, um, I suppose, the, the instructions to GPs in, t in terms of what to do, particularly around prescribing when it comes to young people? 
the, the guidelines are guidelines, um, and uh, you know the, the the fact is that for a GP who's treating all physical mental health conditions, um, they have recourse to literally hundreds of different forms of guidelines, whether they be sign guidelines, UK wide nice guidelines local guidelines from their own health boards or indeed um, best practice information which Royal Colleges like the Royal College of GPs, Royal College of Psychiatrists will have on their website. Um, looking at the information that's available for treating depression, um, there is a, 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 a very detailed, very thorough um, NICE guideline, which is UK-wide on the treatment of depression, which was last revised in 2016 and, and has reviewed the evidence to date at that point on really all aspects of treating depression, including um, uh, antidepressants and including children and young people. Um, the sign guidelines in Scotland are about uh, non-pharmacological treatment uh, for depression um, and as I say they, they are available and they are current um, so uh, I, I, I suppose the short answer is I, I can't I wouldn't see currently that there would be a need for a revision of the of the extant um, guidelines that are available to clinicians thank you Mackay. thank you convener yes on the guidelines um, issue do you or does the General Medical Council have any way of monitoring GPs who don't appear to be following those guidelines? Or does that have to come in the form of a complaint from the patient or from the patient's family? Um, the the uh, the monitoring of doctors' practice um, it really is through this process of peer review to appraisal to revalidation and relicensing, which is laid out uh, in the GMC and is a UK requirement for doctors. Can I just stop What's peer review mean? Oh, peer review. Um, uh, well. I, I, in terms of the uh, 50 hours of continuing professional development, the way that that is checked, that you have actually done what you've said you're, you're going to be doing, and to have the conversation about, well, what might it be sensible for you to do next year? How that process works is that you meet a group of peers who, who are usually organised at health board level um, to then look back at what you've done and look forward at what you've done and to take the time, if you like, to um, check that what you're saying is accurate. Um, that then, that, that information then gets informed both to your Royal College but also to your annual appraisal meeting. And the annual appraisal has to bring that information as well as information from other sources. So GPs receive individual information about their prescribing, for example, which may or may not be discussed. Um, and uh, uh, the, the presence of any complaints would also be something that would be discussed at appraisal with the reflection on on those complaints and what actions an individual did. Um, and that material then feeds into a GMC revalidation process. It's, it's kind of self-governing then? Um, only at the, the level of the peer review. The peer review is to look at the continuing professional development, but the, uh, the actual appraisal, which is the GM, which is a national um, process, that is a, that has an independence. It's not it's not your your local peers that do that. It's it's a, a nominated appraiser who has a special training um, that is a, is allocated people to appraise on an annual basis. Does any sort of sampling of case reviews occur? Anything you know particular? Um, I am not aware of that. No. Thank you. Um, if I could just go back to the, the, the schools-based counselling. Um, in your review of the counselling, um, are you giving any consideration to the system of schools counselling that's been developed elsewhere, such as in Wales, uh, Wales or anywhere else? Are you using... So in terms of the review of personal and social education, um, we hope to get um, the review of the findings uh, towards the end of this year. Um, and obviously, we will be looking at um, what happens in other areas, like Wales has been mentioned. Um, it may not be the sort of system that we want to uh, introduce uh, in Scotland. Um, but absolutely, we'll be, be looking at, at what we can learn um, from um, other areas. Um, that's um, part part of the review. Um, 
it is the current position is is that it's for local authorities um, to decide what best support services fit the needs uh, of their local um, schools and and circumstances um, and not all schools will take up um, the the same it, it will be down to um, different schools making to having different approaches so some may use school nurses, some will, may, may train teachers, um, some may take in uh, counsellors, and it wouldn't be appropriate uh, to advocate a one-size-fits-all approach um, to this. So we will wait and see what the review uh, of uh, PSE uh, has, and we'll have a workshop to see um, what recommendations we can make. Um, and, and as I said earlier, we can also uh, learn from best practice that's happening already in Scotland. Yeah, from from my experience in my constituency, just on that point of of um, one size fits all, um, the problems that people have and families have in accessing mental health care, in my experience, um, is that it can be very confusing the system, and they don't have a single point of contact. They may have four or five people who are dealing with a specific case, and when they're trying to, the, the, the communication is poor. Will there be any consideration given to sort of? trying to streamline the process so that that um, families know who to contact when and they're not dealing with four different people because that is a huge problem I found well you know it depends on on what the what the problem is if it's a problem with school work no, to mental health services so in the first instance um, if you have a mental health problem, the first in the port of call will be your GP practice. Yes. Beyond that, I'm talking about beyond that. Once it's established, they need a referral. Um, that there are, there can be half a dozen people that they can contact. They don't seem to have a, a single point of contact. And that will depend on what services are available in your local area. So there, are, there might be a variety of youth groups or third sector organisations that have a different way of dealing with different aspects. So yes, that's why you know we have a plethora of organisations um, working in this field in different local authority areas or health board areas. And it's making sure um, that GP practices are aware of all the different uh, organisations that work in this field, have had conversations with the people running those organisations and know um, where best to refer to. So, for example, as I said uh, yesterday, I was down at the junction uh, in Leith in Edinburgh and GPs refer to, um, to the junction as well as uh, schools and uh, youth groups. So is it down to the local authority then to organise the best? I mean, can, can you understand why that can be confusing to somebody who doesn't know the system, has never had to, to enter it before, and there, there's all these people who are involved, and all of a sudden, who do I contact? Yeah, and that's why um, a, a link worker in a GP practice will be a person who has an oversight of all the different organisations available. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, getting it right for every child is the is the system that is uh, rolling out in Scotland, and through that system there should be um, single points of contact and ways of um, ensuring that all the professionals involved in a child's um, you know in in the sort of entirety of a child's life are being coordinated and that there's a single child's plan as well if the child requires that so I guess that would be it's not happening in my area but hopefully that will come well, yeah I, I think, think that's what, you know one yeah. of the reasons where a named person has a big role yes, to play yeah. exactly yeah thank you um one person responsible for 400 young people as a named person might be a challenge in relation to that but can I ask you said it wouldn't be one size fits all but would it be reasonable to expect at school level there should be a minimum standard. I, mean, I was quite surprised what you said, that access to third sector whatever it would be through a GP. That feels like yes. a, a massive burden. I, th you know, I mean, going back 20 years, I ran what was called a joint assessment team where you worked with families, teachers, whomsoever was around the child, including the child themselves, identified what support they needed and then accessed that support. I mean, it feels a very medical model to say that you have to go to a GP to then get referred back to these things. I'm not sure, but I'm not convinced of the school-based um, counsellor model. I think there should be counsellors within schools, but would you not accept if that were 
properly funded at school level. And of course, for young people outside the school system, that's a different matter. But that if there were expertise at school level to direct young people to the appropriate support that's out there in the community, that would be something that would give certainty. It's not one size fits all, but it is a minimum standard that any young person in Scotland could expect. I didn't say that everybody should go through their GP. I decided it depended uh, on, on the level of, of severity. So, um, as John has said, you know, some people uh, will be experiencing anxiety and distress, but they may not have a clinical diagnosis or, a cl or be clinically depressed. So, um, what um, we are getting back is that, you know, there is already good practice in some schools and in some areas, um, and schools have access to um, a, a variety of people through school counsellors, through educational psychologists, and it won't be for us to prescribe, because that's not within our remit, but, you know, local authorities, after they've seen the review that we're carrying out, will be able to decide what is best practice for them and their schools. In, in response to the question of Rona Mackay, that the, the point of contact was the GP? That is one of the points of contact. So it, it doesn't answer the question when there's three or four different... You know, where do you go? The idea of somebody within the school setting, for example, has absolute responsibility for ensuring and taking you through that journey. The, the first point, the point of contact wouldn't be the GP. Well, if, if a child in school uh, goes to their guidance teacher... Um, the guidance teacher, in my view, should ha have the skills through perhaps mental health first aid training and through the training that they do for guidance um, to think about what would be the best course of action in conjunction with the child and perhaps the parents as to what should happen to take forward um, counselling or whatever is required for that child. And th what we need to make sure is that everybody in that local area knows with the available resources, whether it be in the third sector, the voluntary sector, um, through the local authority, what is available in terms of services available for that person. Last question, Michelle. Well, that, that leads us on very nicely to the fact that during the um, sessions we had with the voluntary sector, we heard that a, a target previously existed that 50% of frontline staff should receive mental health training through applied suicide intervention training and skills-based training on risk manager. Um, now, the good news is that target was achieved. Um, the bad news is there's no longer a target in place and only 50% receiving it means that 50% haven't. And we also know, obviously, that there's a turnover of GPs, new ones coming, old ones going. So where are you with that? And what assessment has been made of the outcomes um, being achieved by the delivery of that target? And is there any intention to review a target and bring one in and ensure that that um, training is taking place? So just in general terms, heat targets um, are reviewed all the time and, you know, and so that there's not overload of heat targets, the um, priorities change from time to time. So the former heat target on suicide prevention training uh, for key frontline staff ended in 2010 uh, because that had been exceeded all, in all board areas. At least 50% of frontline staff across Scotland had been trained in suicide event, uh, prevention uh, awareness techniques. And then, as a matter of good practice, NHS boards continue uh, with this work in order to maintain uh, at least 50% of frontline staff trained in suicide prevention awareness techniques. Um, any chess boards um, who are interested uh, in suicide prevention training should always uh, contact NHS Health Scotland and we're currently discussing with NHS Scotland their plans to refresh and uh, reinvigorate their suite of training programmes in both suicide prevention and wider me mental health uh, awareness. Um, as I said earlier, we're currently preparing a new draft suicide prevention action plan and we're going to be undertaking public uh, engagement in the spring with a view to publishing the final version in the summer. Uh, and this engagement process will afford stakeholders the opportunity to contribute their views um, and their aspirations on action to support suicide uh, prevention. Um, we should 
recognise that there's been a 17% reduction in suicides in Scotland and we want to continue um, that trend and um, the action plan will reflect what needs to be done and reviewed and revised to take that forward. Mm -hmm. And could I ask one final question? Um, as you're probably aware, um, the way in which um, inspections take place of, of children's services now has changed and they look across the board. Um, so when they come into school now, they're not just looking at the school, they're looking at all the associated services, voluntary sector, and as part of that there is case sampling um, and when social work are inspected there is case sampling to look at whether the decision process and the handling of that child's case is correct um, and, and to give an idea of the quality of the services that are being delivered. You said earlier in response to, to Rona Mackay's question that there is, to your knowledge, no routine sampling of cases for GPs. Do you think there's a gap there in terms of looking at the decision-making processes um, and the treatment decisions that um, are applied through GPs? Um, GPs all, as part of their appraisal, have to uh, write a, a series of reflective commentaries on things that have happened in their practice. Uh, and the expectation is that any complaints or critical incidents, um, any adverse events would be subject to those reflective considerations and those would be discussed at appraisal. Um, so that is an opportunity uh, really to uh, provide the time and the space um, to independently look at and reflect on when things haven't gone as well as as, as they could do uh, with GPs and, and in, with other specialists. That is what I would recognise as clinical supervision um, in, in terms of reflecting on your own practice and decisions make, which is very different to an independent sample review of case management. Um, and, and that's the bit I'm querying because your, your reflective practice is... is a choice thing around looking at what you've noticed as not being good or not being bad or, or how you feel about something, whereas an independent review of case management is slightly different. Um, and I just, I'm asking the question whether you consider there's a gap there in terms of that independent reflective review of case management. So there will be a review of situations like the one we're describing uh, in, in this oh, position. Complaints. Yeah, okay, just let me finish. And um, in terms of uh, health boards, they review um, prescribing from from GP practices uh, uh, indiv and individual GPs practicing uh, prescribing practice. And if there are any outliers, they can they can identify that same as they can identify um, GPs who are sending more people uh, into hospital and, and and to consultants. That's all monitored by the board, and they can bring that up at the annual appraisal. I, I think the idea of sampling case management, I think it would be challenging in the sense of, you know, the case management of what, you know, if you were talking about the case management of all mental health presentations of people of a certain age, I think, again, that would be very difficult to define because, as we were saying earlier, um, you know, what what is... Um, problems in your life seeking help and what is a mental health... Um, a, 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 contact and what's a, a mental disorder contact so um, I, I think I think the, the, the problem is in the definition for me of what exam exactly you would be sampling thank you. okay thank you very much I think we've um, got to the end of our questioning although I've got a lot of questions left in my head subsequent to to reflect on in in, in terms of the evidence we've heard so um, I also want to invite members to discuss what we think we should do with the petition. I think I would want to see, um, first of all, to thank the petitioner again. I realise that we are talking about a general issue which she's talking about and her family indeed are talking about her daughter, which has always had a massive and devastating effect on all of them. And uh, if Annette McKenzie and her family are able to make another response to the petition, I think that would be extremely helpful. But we're very aware just how painful that, that must be for her. But we do hope that and I, and I think the purpose in her taking this forward was to try and inform thinking so that perhaps other families don't have to suffer in the same um, way. And I'm just interested in people's views and what we should be maybe now doing. We should contact, I think, the petitioner in the first instance. Anything else? Um, 
think, I think it's an extremely complicated subject. I mean, there's, there's no doubt, you know, as Dr. Mitchell has pointed out, the, the point of contact and the decision making at that point of contact when it comes to mental health is particularly difficult. Um, I think in terms of crisis and I think the exploration of, of that decision is somebody in crisis and therefore should you resort straight away to a pharmacological intervention is very challenging but I wonder whether or not that needs some more exploration around should there be a specialist um, a requirement to have some sort of specialist consultation before you put particularly a young person onto um, a prescription. I've had with GPs they have said to me in the past the way the system operates and they weren't talking about mental health issues in particular I can give time to give a, I can give a prescription mm -hmm. but I can't give time yes. because the pressures are so massive and I'm wondering whether it's would be interesting I mean I'm very interested in whether there is evidence or we sh should we be getting evidence on you know the correlation between first visit with um, anxiety or distress and prescription mm. and is that now is that what's happening or in fact is there is at the end of a longer period because I think that would tell us something I I, I must say I'm concerned about seeing simply an increase in prescription as a positive because it means people are talking about mental health. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when they talked about the housewife's little helpers when women went to the doctor and they were routinely given mm. Valium or whatever it would be. And I think medically GPs have moved on from that and thank goodness for that. And we would be concerned if there are pressures that would maybe bring that back together. So I would be interested in yeah. establishing how we'd get that kind of evidence. And I'd be very concerned, you know, to, to be clear that in no way are we implying that GPs are not not doing their job um, but we have to recognize that the time in which they have yeah. to see a patient and the time in which they have to to draw conclusion you know is is around 10 minutes per visit mm. and therefore that even if they saw that person four times you know you're still only talking about less than an hour to make that mm. judgment call um, and as, as Dr. Mitchell um, replied in response to my question, you know, you wouldn't, a psychologist or a, a psychiatrist would not expect to do it in such a short period of time. Um, and I think that's something that, that needs some consideration with the rise in mental health issues, with the rise in the number of people seeking help, which is a, is a positive thing. And I, I accept, you know, the minister's comment around that. Um, it, is, it is really important. But I think it's something that we can't just walk away from and say that, you know, 10 minutes is an adequate mm -hmm. diagnostic time. And I was interested in this thing about, we, we, we can see the logic of a young person who's been diagnosed with cancer, having their family round about them and immediately putting supports in place. But this question of confidentiality comes. Now, I, can, I understand I've worked with young people who didn't want their families to know what their concerns were, because some of these things were enmeshed around family and, and all of that kind of thing. But I would be interested to explore further with the medical profession, the that difference between that, the that two. Was, that was my point. I think part of the, the core of this petition is about confidentiality in cases like this and the correlation between, you know, if it was a physical um, illness, the family would be involved. The fact that it's not um, you know, I think we need to ask whether maybe the General Medical Council, whether they would consider looking at that again um, in terms of the GP taking a decision on how serious it was if, if in that mm. instance it's the family difficult. could be involved mm. because there, there seems to be a disconnect between the two, although I respect a young person's right to confidentiality. Um, I, I think that's something we need to, to explore because that's, that's at the heart of this really. It's not necessarily either about their family knowing, it's about having a responsible oh, well, well, person uh, yes, that yes, they can talk to, yes, that, that they can oversee person. and be aware of what's going on with them. Yeah, a relevant person. There is also an issue around informed consent as well. Yes. Um, I mean, you can't possibly give informed consent without knowing all the potential consequences, side effects. And again, um, in my experience and most people's experience, you do not get a complete rundown on um, what a drug may or may not do to you when a prescription is handed over. Um, okay. And I think that's a, a big issue. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Camina. I think um, clearly we need to reflect further on uh, 
uh, at a future meeting on, on the evidence that we've heard today, but uh, I think one of the salient points that's come out of uh, the evidence session is that uh, uh, we do need stats on, on when or at what stage antidepressants are prescribed, uh, and if these stats don't exist, as would seem to be uh, the case, then we need to, make, we need to ensure that, uh, that they are available in the future and that, uh, and that if there is any, any indication at the current time, then that, uh, that is shared with us. Okay, that's a good point. Okay. Can I suggest what we do is maybe ask the clerks to draw together these issues that we've highlighted, maybe reflecting back in the evidence, and then we can look again at what that then means in terms of taking further evidence. I think that would be worthwhile, but I, don't, I think at this point, again, I think we're grateful to the Minister for um, the time she's taken on, on these questions this morning, but also that there are some further questions we'd want to explore. Is that agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. In that case, can I suspend briefly?
can uh, call the meeting back to order. Our second agenda item is evidence in Petition 1651 by Marion Brown on prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. We last considered this petition on 7th of December 2017 and agreed that we would wish to seek oral evidence from the Minister. Both the Minister for Mental Health and Dr Mitchell have remained with us, so thank you. And I also welcome Jenny S Simons, Policy Officer, Mental Health and Protection of Rights Division, Scottish Government, for this evidence session. As members will know, we have received a large number of submissions on this petition, primarily from people who wish to let us know about their experiences in relation to prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. And I'd like to extend our thanks to all of those who have taken the time to provide their views. As members know, our role is not to look at it into the circumstances of any individual case, but submissions such as um, we have received do convey the strength and depth of feeling that exists on this issue for a range of people. And I'm sure I speak for everybody on the committee to say that that was a very... Just reading through the submissions in preparation for the committee was had a very significant impact on me, and I'm sure it did on, on everyone else. And we're genuinely very grateful um, because we know that people are not writing about something theoretical, they're writing about their own direct experience. So, as with the previous session, I'd like to invite the Minister to make some opening remarks before we turn to questions from the committee members. Um, thank you, Convener. And can I also start by thanking the petitioner, uh, Marion Brown, on behalf of Recovery and Renewal, for having brought this pres uh, petition. Prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal is an important issue, as you said, Convener, demonstrated by the level of response uh, to this petition. And I'm grateful to the respondees who have taken the time to share their own personal experiences, many of which I, I read too. Psychological therapies have an important role in helping people with mental health problems who should have access to effective treatment, both physical and psychological. And I welcome the opportunity to discuss this issue in more detail. The Scottish Government has and will continue to emphasise the importance of parity in physical and mental health services. People with mental illness should expect the same standard of care as people with physical illness and should receive medication if they need it, just as someone would receive medication for a physical illness. The Scottish Government has worked hard with partner organisations to reduce the stigma faced by people with mental health problems, and this has been reflected in the rise in demand for mental health services across Scotland. As this stigma declines, we see more people coming forward to seek help from their GPs for problems such as depression. As a consequence, we have seen more people being prescribed antidepressants, but this has been accompanied by better diagnosis and treatment of depression by G GPs. The responses to the petition also highlight the issue of appropriate prescribing. In terms of guidance for prescribing of mental health drugs within Scotland, the SIGN guidelines provide evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for the NHS in Scotland. SIGN guidelines are designed to bring new knowledge into action to meet our aim of reducing variations in practice and improving outcomes. These guidelines are produced in collaboration with patients, carers and members of the public and include SIGN 114 on non-pharmaceutical therapies encompassing psychological therapies, structured exercise and lifestyle interventions, and a range of alternative and complementary treatments in the management of depression. Often, prescribing involves not just drugs. While we ensure those who need medication continue re to receive it, we are also committed to improving access to psychological therapies that increase choice and best accommodate patient preference. And we're undertaking a range of actions in our 10-year strategy to transform mental health services in Scotland to respond to this. These include working to improve access to services, developing new models of care within primary health services, and a national rollout of cognitive behavioural therapy, as well as dis developing intervention responses to those in crisis through the distress brief intervention pilots being funded across Scotland. Furthermore, while medical student teaching now emphasises that medication has an important place in treatment, this should not be overused 
are continued indefinitely and decisions should always involve the patient so that they understand both the potential benefits and risks of making a decision to take them. This needs to be within an enabling environment where support and a range of information sources are readily accessible by, patients as, by, by the patients. Our guiding ambition for mental health is simple, but if realised will change and save lives, that we must prevent and treat mental health problems with the same commitment, passion and drive as we do with physical health problems. We want to create a Scotland where all stigma and discrimination related to mental health is challenged and our collective understanding of how to prevent and treat mental health problems is increased. We want to see a nation where mental health care is person-centred and, and recognises the life-changing benefits of fast, effective treatment. Now, I'd like to answer questions. Thank you very much, um, Minister. I think a theme of the, the submissions we got were people concerned about being um, prescribed drugs, <coughs> excuse me, without adequate explanation of, of the consequence of it, without any other supports being available, and then being left on these drugs for a long period of time without support to withdraw. So that's the underlying um, concern that's been identified by the petitioners and others. Um, I, I can ask, in the previous evidence session, we discussed the issue of GP training in relation to prescribing decisions. And there is a related question for this petition regarding training available to GPs. The petitioner has commented that GPs are being held responsible by everyone, but they do not have expertise, knowledge or training to support people safely to withdraw from these prescriptions. And I wonder if you have a response to that view. Um, well, as we said in, in uh, answer to the, to the last petition, um, convener, um, in 2014, the Scottish Government published key information on the use of antidepressants in Scotland. And what this illustrated was that the quality of antidepressant prescribing appears to have improved in recent years from being too often used in less than effective dose for too short periods of time to longer, more appropriate durations of treatment at higher average doses, which are more effective and reduce the risk of recurrent bouts of illness in the long term. And the briefing paper also highlighted that the rise in prescription of antidepressants in Scotland is for the most part explained by better diagnosis and treatment of depression by GPs. And research from within academic centres in Scotland confirms that antidepressants are being prescribed in line with current endorsed clinical guidelines and improvements in this will continue. There's consistent evidence of undertreatment of depression and we know that the personal and economic costs of having depression are high and we need to continue to work in on ways to improve its recognition and effective treatment. The use of antidepressants by an individual is a dynamic process and varies due to the relapsing and remitting nature of the illness and individual treatment preferences. They don't work for ev everyone, but for those that do respond, the evidence for antidepressant treatment reducing relapse is strong. And there's no evidence that having greater access to psychological therapies will reduce antidepressant prescribing, rather access to appropriate and effective treatments, which will include antidepressants, is improved. Can I just say I'm, I'm quite concerned by that response, because what you seem to be saying the problem is, and the, the way it's been addressed, is by giving people stronger drugs and leaving them on them longer. When what the petitioner is saying is that people are uh, given drugs without the appropriate information about the consequence of it, are left on it without other supports, and are then left and are not the GPs don't have the expertise in supporting them to withdraw. So I think that is at the, the core of the petition. But specifically on the question I asked you, which was, um, what support do you, do you believe GPs have been given? What expertise do they have in supporting people to withdraw from these drugs? Because that's more clinical, that John, you can answer that. Yes. Um, so uh, the the drugs that we're talking about, um, the drugs that cause 
that can cause problems in withdrawal um, include obviously the painkillers, particularly opiate medications, which may be prescribed not just by GPs, but by specialists in hospitals, for example, in, in cancer care. Um, the, uh, the sleeping tablet drugs like benzodiazepines and the Z drugs, uh, which are anti-anxiety and uh, sleep medicines, and again might be prescribed by GPs um, or by specialists. Um, and uh, those two types of classes of drugs <laughs> cause dependence in that um, to, as you stay on the drugs, your body becomes tolerant to them and you have to increase the dose to continue to have the effect. And when you stop taking the drugs, you get withdrawal symptoms and that's the, the definition of dependence. Antidepressants um, uh, themselves have withdrawal uh, side effects, they have discontinuation reactions, but they aren't dependent in the same way as the other drugs in that there isn't tolerance associated with them. You don't have to keep pushing the dose up to get the same effect. The, um, the, the point that you were making, I suppose, first of all, convener, about uh, the uh, decision-making relationship between the patient and the prescriber, uh, th that is something that, that realistic medicine, I think, really is at the heart and soul of realistic medicine and the work that's going through that. Um, and not only is the, the uh, work on consent that we talked about in, in our last evidence, but there's also a, re a revision of the health literacy plan in Scotland, which is about how we have conversations with people about the treatments that we provide for them. And uh, just to address the point that you made about GPs um, being on their own with this. Um, it's not so much the GP who is responsible for the prescribing of all of these drugs and, and potential side effects and potential withdrawal, but really the prescriber who is responsible for that. And there are a whole variety of different sorts of prescribers now, so that there are um, obviously specialists in hospitals who may be doctors or maybe pharmacists. There are prescribers in primary care um, and, uh, and, and in, indeed advanced nurse practitioners are prescribing uh, for some conditions. So um, I don't think there would be an expectation that a GP would be left ever feeling that they were on their own managing um, the complications of prescribing, you know, across that uh, that range. But certainly for a medication that a GP has initiated, uh, that, that GP would be responsible for that treatment. Can I clarify from the Minister and yourself, do you accept the premise of the petition that there are people who have been, um, who were not capable, were not given proper advice about the consequences of taking the, these particular prescriptions? That they, so that that idea of informed consent is a challenge. They put on them, they're not given other supports and they're left on these, on these uh, drugs and that the GP would not necessarily know how to support them to withdraw from these. Are, that's the fundamental premise of the of the petition. Do you accept that, that that has happened? It does happen, and does it concern you that it happens? Well, I wouldn't accept that it re routine, <coughs> routinely happens. Um, you know, obviously, in terms of those that have written in relation to this um, this petition, uh, in some cases, the petitioners feel that that has happened. But you know, I wouldn't. We wouldn't accept the premise that it routinely happens. Does happen? Pardon? Does it happen? Well, in in relation to the, as I've said, in relation to the petitioners that have responded to this petition, they feel that that has happened. But I'm asking you as whether you think it happens. It doesn't have to happen routinely for us to be concerned about it. Does it happen? Are GPs in a? You know, do they not have the, the right support? And do you, and. If you don't accept it happens, that's fine. But if you do accept it happens, what is the response of government in order to address the concerns highlighted by the petitioner? Yeah, I think drugs for longer uh, and stronger. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the people's perceptions of their care. I think uh, you know, I'm I'm very ha I'm I'm happy to accept that that's what people's descriptions of their care has been. Um, I think. Um, Do you believe them? Do you accept? I mean, there is yes, a difference between yeah, yes. saying 
Yes. Somebody thinks this, yes. this is how they feel, yes. or do you say they, they feel yes. something that's legitimate? Yes. You do yes. accept it's legitimate. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I mean, I think the descriptions that people have had of the the problems they have had with prescribed medication, I recognise and uh, accept. I think those don't rec those don't represent the the normal or the average. I think that they are they are situations people have chosen to tell us about. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, people's uh, feeling about what they are. Um, the quality of the the kind of consent and information conversation that they had with the prescriber, uh, you know, I'm I'm perfectly uh, happy to accept that there will be occasions where those conversations aren't happening as as well as they probably as well as they probably could do. But I think there are there, there will be other conversations that happen extremely well in terms of um, explaining to people what their options are and uh, I, I, you know and, and discussing the pros and cons with those. Um, and I think uh, I, I think on the on the issue of support for GPs um, again. Um, you know, GPs are inside a, a primary care team of people. Um, they have access to guidance, um, as we discussed earlier. They can pick up the phone and speak to specialists should they wish. They uh, have the opportunity, which they describe regularly doing, of talking to each other about clinical situations that they're involved with. Um, and uh, you know, and, and specifically for for prescribing, um, you know, we we are rolling out um, improved pharmacy uh, both in the community, but also in primary care. Um, and uh, health boards tell us that by March uh, this this year in 2018, um, that we'll we'll have 200 uh, new pharmacists, whole time equivalent pharmacists, in addition to 50 uh, pharmacy assistants in uh, you know in practice practices all across Scotland. So um, so if, if so GPs uh you know, are, are not isolated in uh, having to struggle with complicated um, prescribing issues. Uh, the, you know, the support is, is there for them and, and that they would describe using that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rona Mackay? Sorry, can Jenny just add a bit about the matrix? I thought it would be helpful also to highlight that NHS Scotland has developed something called the Psychological Therapies Matrix. It's an evidence-based resource that highlights different combinations of therapies and approaches to treating a range of different conditions, depression being a large part of the guidance within that. It's how you can combine both medications and different approaches, therapies and other sources of support, which doctors also have available to them as well, which might be worth highlighting as, as well as the sign guidance that's also been developed within Scotland for GPs and other practitioners and clinical staff to refer to as well. Rona McKay. Thank you, Convener. Yes, just on that, do we have statistics um, on the number of people suffering withdrawal from antidepressants? Depressants, um, or we, from no, from drugs generally, whatever prescription drugs. Uh, be, we, because we, we don't have a, a unified number that describes that. We we have the the Royal College of Psychiatrists um, did look at uh, did do some research into discontinuation reaction from antidepressants, and they published that on their website. Um, the uh, it, it, I, I can. Find the numbers for you. I mean, I, I think, helpful. yeah, I think the um, the, uh, the the experience of discontinuation reactions from antidepressants is actually really quite common, um, and pretty much affects every antidepressant from every class. But in general, the uh, the actual discontinuation reactions, the symptoms are mild and self-limiting. So the the the, the nature of really how severe this is and how challenging this is, we, we, we can't really define that. But as, as I say, the Royal College of Psychiatrists do, do have information from a sort of survey of, um, and I think we are perfectly happy to accept that. You know, these are real, um, these are real symptoms that people have, um, and certainly uh, for people who are on the dependent drugs like opiates and benzodiazepines without careful careful handling it almost 100 percent of people would have withdrawal uh reactions to that and and that's why there is um 
guidance and information clinically available to, to help people work out how to cut down drug doses and how to reduce drug doses. So that for antidepressants, the Royal College of Psychiatrists says that the tapering should take place over a four-week period in order to allow the body to adjust to, to those medicines. And, and do you feel that the, the patient has been given enough information about the possible side effects and withdrawal and is it down to the doctor to manage that, the GP to manage that? Um, the, 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 prescribing, the prescribing of a medicine and then what happens with that medicine is the responsibility of the person who's doing the prescribing. Um, and for doctors, the GMC, again, is quite clear about the responsibilities on doctors uh, in, that, in that respect. Um, a, the... the you know, clearly the people who have given us evidence have described, uh, you know, situations where uh, they have not felt that they have been um, listened to or involved or properly informed. Um, but I would have to say from my clinical experience and from uh, talking to other doctors, whether the representatives of professional bodies or not, uh, I mean, n you know, no clinician, uh, people want the best for their patients. No clinician wants a patient to suffer either because of a disease or because of, you know, a problem with the treatment for that, that disease. Um, and, uh, you know, doc doctors will, will work hard to try to make sure that they're delivering information in a way um, that is understandable um, and is a tolerable amount of information um, for people so that they can come to a, a, a kind of true decision about what they want. Um, Clearly the people who have uh, given submissions to us either weren't aware of the possible withdrawal and side effects um, because no one would, I would imagine, agree to take a drug that was going to have that effect when they come off it, I mean, they just wouldn't do it. So either they weren't told um, or it wasn't explained clearly enough to them. Would you accept that? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what happened in an individual com conversations. I, I think if you were put on any opiate um, painkiller, you would expect to be told, you, you know, that, that this painkiller is very strong and that when you stop it or when you come off it, we'll need to do that carefully. Um, I think people have a general understanding about painkillers, probably also about sleeping tablets. Certainly, I think antidepressants, um, you know, it, it is really the responsibility of the people prescribing to make sure that people are aware of potential side effects, including the withdrawal side effects. And, um, you know, should a member of the public want to find out more about that, you know, there, there's a leaflet, for example, about coming off antidepressants on the Royal College of Psychiatry website. There is information on NHS Inforum that, that, that gives quite a lot of detail for people um, with medication problems and coming off medicines. But, I mean, people need to know that that information is there. Um, and and that is good clinical practice, you know, as is described by the GMC, the relationship that a clinician um, has with their patient and how they are mutually following a course of action to the betterment of that patient's situation. There clearly is a problem when, I mean, and that would presumably only be a, a small percentage of people who are have experienced severe, you know, life-limiting uh, side effects um, and it's happening so the system isn't perfect I mean no system is going to be perfect um, uh, you know I, I would accept that um, the, the, the life the life limiting consequences I think are very rare and I think if a person um, you had ongoing you know major severe difficulties as a consequence, then support is available um, to help with that. And this is another case where maybe statistics would be useful to find out exactly how many, or to get an idea of how many people were suffering these severe symptoms. Uh, well, I, 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 again, it would be difficult to... Um, Sort of set a threshold for that. Uh, as I say, we, we know that discontinuation reactions are actually very common. Um, uh, but, the, but the issue is, you know, when is that something that's self-limiting and that people will manage um, through good communication with the prescriber? You know, and, and when do we have an unusual situation where uh, 
you know, where where uh, more help is needed. And it's, it's difficult because, you know, the drawing, where would you draw the line across across that spectrum of experience? Okay, thanks. Can, can I ask the, the Minister, um, on the 10-year mental health strategy, which you outlined at the beginning, you mentioned new models of care. I wonder if you could maybe expand on what that might be within the strategy? Well, um, in terms of the strategy, it is making sure um, that people have the range of therapies um, available to them. So it might not, um, as we've talked about in the previous petition, you know, immediately being put on antidepressants, but following the discussion with the GP, it will be um, a range of, of therapies, including psychological therapies, might be computerised cognitive behaviour therapy, it, it might include... Um, you know, more exercise, because there's a, a correlation between uh, um, exercise uh, and depression. Um, they, I don't know if you've spoken to the Scottish Recovery Network, but they have a range of, of um, uh, uh, treatments and interventions that um, they know in ter that are useful in terms of uh, recovery uh, from mental illness. Um, so it's about making sure um, that all these different combinations of treatments um, are available uh, to more people who are coming forward with a mental illness. A warning to, that we do have to stop um, in terms of rules of the Parliament by 22. I'd like the question to finish by half past. Um, and if, you know, we can just keep a focus on that, make sure we cover all of the areas. I think we've, um, I'm the only one that's been straying from it so far. Um, Michelle? Right, thank you, uh, yes, Ms. Um, I want to stay with the strategy, and, and um, I wonder if you could explain how it relates to the delivery of the national performance framework and the mental wellbeing indicator. And I would highlight that um, what we've heard so far has, has sent me into a, a bit of mental confusion, I have to say, because you, you stated that the 2014 quality of prescribe, um, review showed that the quality of prescribing has improved. Um, and that you were moving to longer, higher doses, and that there was consistent evidence of under-treatment. And then you said the use of antidepressants is a dynamic process, and that no evidence that having greater access to psych um, psychological therapies will reduce pharmacological prescribing. And yet you've just been talking about the importance of having alternatives and moving it forward. So I wonder if you could explain, you know, where the strategy is actually going uh, and what it is you're, you're trying to achieve there, because it seems to be a contradiction in the statements that you've made so far. Um, well, um, you know, as we discussed earlier, the Short Life Working Group that John chaired uh, did um, come to the conclusion that it, um, uh, and various articles and journals uh, have come to the conclusion um, that in order to treat um, depression and certain types of mental illness, it's better to have a higher dosage um, for longer. That I'm not the clinician here. Um, but also that we need to, we know that that um, medical prescribing in conjunction with other therapies may have a, a better outcome. So that we've got to make sure as Scottish Government that those alternatives are available. So, if I understand you correctly, you're, you're suggesting that non pharmacological um, options should be combined with prescribing. So you don't see it uh, the strategy as as moving towards reducing prescribing. Well, that's not that's not for a strategy to to have. It, that that's a clinical decision. So. That, that would be to the clinicians to to answer, and given their knowledge. Yeah, just uh, so it was my predecessor that chaired the expert group rather rather than myself, but um, the uh, a uh, the what we're saying is that I, I think we want people to get the treatment that they need for their condition, and uh, as I explained um, in the previous evidence, the, the reason my predecessor set up that expert group and wrote the report that's published was because of a concern about rising prescriptions, but also because we were in that changeover from um, a heat target, which was about 
prescribing of antidepressants to a heat target, which was about psychological therapy uh, delivery. And there was a question at the time, um, would the uh, increase an, of psychological therapies mean that there would be a reduction in antidepressant use? And the available evidence that that group found from a variety of sources, which are cited in the paper, um, didn't support that. So what, what that implied was that if you treat a condition like depression better, that actually there will be, peop there will be more people who have um, medication because medication works for some types of depression. There will be more psychological therapy because psychological therapies, cognitive behavioural therapy has a strong evidence base for treating depression. And, and you should have um, more social therapies and social support because again, we know that that improves. So all of the things go hand in hand that improving access and improving treatment isn't, you know, it's not one, one thing means that you get less of another. In actual fact, you get an uplifting of, of all of it together. Um, and uh, in talking about adults presenting with depression in the, in the generality, again, a, a GP is not, is, before they reach for a prescription pad, they're going to be thinking about the social environment, the occupational environment, family environment, somebody is, what, about what that person can do, for example, with sport or with uh, reducing their alcohol consumption that would improve their 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 um, mood if, if alcohol you know, was, was problematic. Uh, before they even started thinking about, um, might you want to go and talk to somebody about this because we've got these resources available for you, uh, before they might say to somebody, I think you need to go on an antidepressant. And the only situation where that would really be trumped would be, um, for example, in specialist care, if I had a referral from a GP of somebody with depression who was not eating, not drinking, actively suicidal, and psychotic, then I, I would be saying this person needs to go on medicine now because, because life medicines in some situations are life-saving. So what, what then, looking at the mental health strategy, what, what do you perceive it as saying in regards to the physical well-being of, of people with mental health disorders that are actually put on antidepressants, for example? You know, was any consideration given to that link about the physical well-being of people? Well, absolutely, because what, what the you know one of the key um, threads through the whole of the mental uh, health strategy is that people that that doctors and others should look at the whole person. You know, is the mental health as a result of a physical condition that's not being treated, or is the physical condition a result? of having a mental health condition. And we know that people with mental health um, conditions do uh, are likely to have uh, less longevity, 15 to 20 years. And that's an inequality, a health inequality that we must uh, address. And that's very clearly um, one of the reasons um, for that thread running through the mental health um, strategy. So it's about um, doctors and others having the, the time and the space and hopefully um, the new GP contract will give them that to make sure that they can address, the, look at the person as a whole. And in terms of those people who have been on antidepressants and who are experiencing some problems when it comes to withdrawing, we've had some suggestions that tests such as QUIG or SPEC scans of the brain can assist with this. Can you tell us as a committee anything about that? Can you, can you give us any indications of... I am not aware of any published evidence that brain scanning has any uh, therapeutic effect um, in, in relation to medication withdrawal. Mm. So do you have any, any options at all around how to manage withdrawal or recommendations about what should be done around, around those issues? If people are going to be on these drugs, if the recommendations is that they should be on them for longer and on higher doses, then is there anything in the strategy about how you then bring people off them again? And what needs to be done with regards to that? Well, not, not in the strategy. The strategy is more high level than, than telling doctors how to do things. But that's why Jenny mentioned the matrix, because uh, the matrix uh, was produced along with Education Scotland. And, you know, that's a stepped guide to planning and delivering 
evidence-based psychological treatment. So, you know, there's there's a section, for example, on depression. There's a section on ADHD. And we shouldn't forget that with each medicine that you get, you get a leaflet telling you, you know, how to use it and the dosage and, and you know, what to expect of, of that. Thing on basis of reading. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, you know, maybe a lot of people don't read them, but, you know, um, I've had cause to, to read things in relation to some uh, antidepressants. So, um, Th these things are available, and, and NES have produced a booklet also for the general public, which is Psychological Therapies in Scotland, Information for Service Users and Carers. Um, and, you know, the matrix will set out the therapies. But in terms of antidepressants, I mean, you know, at stages, the GP will have a, a review consultation with, with the patient, and if there's a decision to take a person off that, that will be done with the patient in conjunction with whoever oh, the prescriber has been. Okay. Thank you, Mr. MacDonald. Okay. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, the committee is aware that uh, the, the BMA uh, clearly recognises that there is an issue uh, with prescribed drug dependence, as it's called for a, a number of policy changes, including a national 24-hour helpline. Uh, now, the Scottish Government uh, has stated in its written submission that while there is merit in such a helpline, uh, resources to help people with addictions has already, uh, have already been allocated. So could, can you, Minister, um, uh, outline what engagement uh, the Scottish Government has had with the BMA in relation to the establishment of a, a helpline uh, and what services are currently in place to support people with addiction to prescribed medication? of the BMA's uh, call um, for a helpline, um, but I think in discussing uh, the, this, this uh, petition, um, we would like to strongly s indicate that the best person to help with the withdrawal from antidepressants is the person who's prescribed them in the first place. Um, they, they know the, the clinical history uh, of the person who's uh, been on the drugs, but that said, um, if, person, if people want to seek other advice, NHS 24 and NHS Inform uh, operate within Scotland um, and um, community pharmacies are also in a position uh, to give advice. Um, and John, you have been in touch with NHS 24 uh, specifically uh, about this. The, the um, prod uh, as I said, the problematic um, withdrawal is best managed um, by the day-to-day the -day services rather than on a helpline where a person doesn't know the history of the person. So that would be the strong recommendation that we make. But nevertheless, um, John's had a conversation with NHS 24. Uh, the, the, we're, we've obviously seen the BMA's evidence to the committee and we're aware of the work of the, of the all-party group in Westminster and the BMA have, have written to them um, with quite a detailed letter um, I, 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 which is in response to the Department of Health's uh, proposal that um, telephonic support should be through their uh, 111 NHS uh, telephone service. Um, so the, the, the BMA's comments about the English uh, 111 service and the English NHS Choices website and information on that, we've, uh, you know, we've read with interest and have discussed with colleagues in the Department of Health and I've spoken to NHS 24 in Scotland to ask um, how would, uh, what would be the response now in Scotland uh, in, in the situation where somebody who is struggling with a medication um, or, and coming off that medication really of, of any sort uh, phoned them or contacted them for help. Uh, and NHS 24 have said that um, they receive these calls um, that they uh, they have a, a nursing telephonic service 
they have uh, material on the NHS Inform website, and they also in NHS 24 have a pharmacy in NHS 24 to give a higher level of advice. But at the moment, what they were saying is, but beyond that, um, you, you know, beyond that call that's made, then the advice that they would give a Scot phoning up would be, as the minister said, that that first and foremost to discuss this with the prescriber of uh, the the original medicine um, and to seek advice uh, from a pharmacy if needs be, from community pharmacy if they wished, uh, or also, as, as I said earlier, inside the primary care team from the pharmacy supporting the, the primary care uh, centre. So have you, have you had any discussions with the BMA to that effect? We, we haven't spoken directly to the BMA. The, 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 I tried to contact the Scottish Secretary this week, who's on annual leave, um, but I haven't, haven't uh, spoken to them. So attempts have been made. Is that the Royal College of Psychiatrists uh, recognise um, this issue and they have a website and they have a leaflet on the website coming off antidepressants. Okay, right, thanks. Um, if I could turn to uh, or go back to the issue of, of, of sign guidance, um, the written submission from uh, the Scottish Government makes reference to alternatives to medication as referenced in the, the sign guidelines. However, the, the petitioner has stated. Uh, that, uh, and I quote, waiting times for availability of non-pharmacological treatment make a mockery of the application of this existing sign guidance, uh, end quote. How would you respond to these concerns? Well, I think, um, you know, we recognise that in the mental health strategy. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I went to NHS 24 and... Um, I've given them an extra half a million pounds um, to develop their online services, including computerised C uh, cognitive behaviour um, therapy. We are aware um, that for some people, certainly not, not all, but using online services are a preference that they have. And we've got to make sure that these are more widely known um, and available. And NHS 24 indeed um, have an ongoing counselling service as part of their uh, overall service over the telephone, which many people um, have found um, extremely helpful. So there will be a further expansion of the services um, online, including, but also uh, including the, the funding packages that we have in terms of the mental health strategy in order to develop and enhance the supply and training of the workforce in developing uh, evidence-based therapies. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could move on just to one, one other issue that's come up uh, in a number of uh, submissions um, with regard to off-label prescribing of medication. Uh, I understand that this uh, means medications that are being described to treat symptoms uh, or conditions that are outside the terms of the licence of that medication. So I'm curious as to whether you recognise this issue and if so, do you consider that uh, there are any actions that the Scottish Government should take if, uh, if that is the case? Question you, John. <laughs> um, so uh, licensing in the, U in the United Kingdom is, is through the um, Medicines Regulatory Council and uh, the decisions that they make then translate into the information in the British National Formulary, which, which is the UK-wide um, go-to book for prescribers that says, um, you know, the, this medicine, you would use it at this drug for these conditions and not for those conditions and, and give you uh, information about that. Um, the uh, best practice um, for clinicians is that they follow British National Formulary and licensing, uh, you know, licensing arrangements. Um, the, the research is sometimes behind the curve in terms of uh, finding out or knowing what uh, a medicine might be able to, you know, be, be, be worked for. And the reason for that is that uh, generally the, uh, the, the trials that are done on medications uh, require huge numbers of people uh, 
and to be valid trials need to really compare the drug with a placebo or, or, or treatment as usual. And, the, and there are clinical situations where it's actually simply not possible, uh, either because of numbers or because of um, a, or because of you know other issues, to be able to do uh, research. So an example, a good example of that would be antidepressant use in children, um, because antidepressants are prescribed so seldom to children. Um, and and you know currently we have um, uh, you know tens twenties of of antidepressants that we use. That trying to do a randomised controlled trial where we uh, randomly uh, uh, you know associated a child with depression to you know a, a medication versus a placebo or a different treatment it would be something that we we wouldn't get the the numbers required to be able to know whether it was it was a true finding or not and indeed there would be huge consent and ethical issues in doing that so um so the, there are um there are uh, as medications become more widely used, uh, academic centres and experts may well choose to try these medicines out in situations um, that they are not licensed for, that there isn't an evidence base that shows uh, that, that, that it works for that condition. But anecdotally, um, experts and academics might find evidence that those, uh, those treatments work. Um, and uh, and and then specialists uh, who are often managing complex situations would then uh, apply their expertise to think how can I best help my patient, uh, and they would of course use uh, things from uh, a licensing background, the medications that are first line British national formulary. But if those medicines don't work, then there are situations where clinicians, with the agreement of the person, would say, look, this medicine isn't licensed for your condition, but there is evidence that it might help. Do you want to try this or not? And best practice would 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 mean that that conversation would be open and transparent and actually any prescriber who was then going to be using a medicine for a, an off-license indication would make that very clear to the person who was taking that treatment and, and should record you know, that they're doing that and why they're doing that in, in the case notes. Um, and uh, this is an unusual situation, but uh, you know, it, it is far from rare. Okay, that, that's a, a very interesting uh, response given another petition that we have with regard to a uh, thyroid replacement treatment, but uh, um, that's maybe something we can obviously look at in the future. Uh, okay, thanks for, thanks for that. Thank you, convener. Um, <coughs> yes, this, um, my question relates to one that was touched on earlier by Dr. Mitchell in answer to Michelle Ballantyne, and it's about um, doctors... The petitioner refers to what she calls catch-22 situation and where she says that doctors sometimes feel under pressure to prescribe drugs where someone is maybe contemplating suicide and they're doing that on the basis that um, you know non-pharmacological treatments can't be immediately accessed and there's a perception that prescribing medication is more defensible than not. In other words, they're, they're taking a, a, safe, a safe route for that patient. I wonder if you could just... Yeah, expand on that, your concerns? I think I, I recognise that, really. I think as, as a doctor, if you had a patient who you felt was actively suicidal in front of you, um, you would be seeking, you know, emergency specialist help for that. You, you, you know, you wouldn't think somebody's actively suicidal, I'll give them an antidepressant and, and put them out the door. You, Sorry, you, I thought that's what you'd responded earlier to, Michelle. You said that in, in, in the case where it appeared to be so serious, yeah. you would prescribe... I thought that's what you... Well, I, I mean, I, I, I would do that as a consultant psychiatrist. Um, and, uh, I mean, that might be a situation where I had somebody who was an inpatient in a psychiatric hospital. Um, I mean, if I... You, you know, I, I think somebody's safety, you know, comes first, trumps everything. And... Um, you know, I, I think a situation that I, I think I just described of a patient who's not eating, who's not drinking, whose life is at immediate risk. Um, yes, I would prescribe a medication for them, but I would be doing that as an inpatient for that person. I would be, I'd be admitting them and I would be giving them that medicine in a controlled and safe place. So if you put yourself in the position of a GP and you have a patient that comes to you and says, 
I can't take any more. I'm, I'm feeling suicidal. Yeah. You would not prescribe, or you, you would just uh, impose them to. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not a GP, but I, I, my experience is that a GP would would be contacting the local community mental health team and saying, "I need this person seen now," and a community mental health team would be responding to that. And you're confident that the response would be quick enough, and there wouldn't be a delay in that. Um, the, uh, I mean, that, that is the nature of community mental health teams, that you know, there is a, a lot of work that is done that is routine and scheduled, but a great deal of the work is, um, you know, considered to be urgent or emergency. You, usually, um, the community mental health teams work on the sy system of emergency referrals means drop everything and deal with it right now, and urgent means it needs seen within 24 hours. Um, and uh, more often than not, referral forums from GPs you know, will will explicitly say on it what what level of intervention they are seeking, and and I mean in a situation where a patient was with a GP saying that they were actively suicidal, um, no community mental health team would be waiting for you know a typed up referral letter. You would you would deal with the practicalities of it there and then. Um, it would be nice to get some information, but the, you know you 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 deal with the risk, you know, in the moment um, and. I don't believe that GPs are using it as a kind of safe option for them and for the patients say, well, just in case I'll, I'll prescribe, um, you know, in, ca in case this is going to get out of hand or whatever. Um, you don't think that that happens generally? No, I, I don't. I don't really. I, I don't recognise that. I mean, I think in, I'm, you could actually argue it the other way around. If you were a GP, that if you had somebody who was in and they were sort of, you were concerning you about their level of suicidality, and you were asking them, "Are you thinking of ending your life?" and they were saying, "No, I'm not." And this is quite a common situation. And you would be thinking, "Do I trust what they're saying?" You know, your gut feeling is actually this person is is high risk, even although they're saying, "No, doctor, um, I'm not suicidal, and I'm not thinking of ending my life." Um, that actually, uh, the, the your your concern about that might be that well, for you just to say, "Well, they're not actively suicidal," I'll give you an antidepressant and away you go. That that really might lead to greater criticism than than you know than not prescribing. Okay. Um, two things that I would like to mention in relation to this. One is um, the distress brief intervention pilots that were running in six areas across Scotland so that there um, will, is, there, is immediate access uh, to counsellors who any, for anybody who presents to A&E or um, have become known to the, the police or are in police custody, that there is immediate access within 24 hours to um, a, a counsellor in those situations. The, the pilots just started uh, in October. There's already some um, good uh, feedback uh, when I went to, uh, to Lanarkshire to see what they're doing there. And the other thing is that the commitment for um, a more a, an extra 800 um, mental health workers are precisely in these allocate in these areas, so that we can um, make sure that even out of hours, um, well obviously, some, if somebody presents, that there is immediate help. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I th one last point I suppose I would want to make. You spoke earlier, Minister, about um, any drugs come with a little leaflet. I wonder if you accept that the little leaflet has no authority in comparison with the authority of the GP. And I wonder whether you think should the GP almost kind of humanise what that little leaflet says so people do really know what the consequences are? Well, yeah, oh, I, absolutely. I, I, I mean, you know, I think we all know when we go to the GP what if, some, if the doctor prescribes something, um, they usually tell you what, what to expect from, from, the, from the prescription. But I accept that, you know, there are maybe cases where that's not happening. Can I, sorry? What, briefly, yeah. Yeah, um, it, again, just for clarity, I wondered if you, if you could comment whether you accept these statements um, that were given to us in evidence. 10% of the population of Scotland takes an antidepressant on prescription. Of those between 80 and 90% are on treatment for more than a year, many for over a decade. Um, 
I would ask the question, do you think that that is because it is good treatment or because dependence is occurring? And the second statement, at present rates of antidepressant use among adolescents in Scotland, especially among women, is rocketing. These drugs are on their way to being the most commonly used prescription drugs by Scottish adolescents. Do you recognise, would you agree or disagree with those statements? I don't recognise much of that. I, 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 I think certainly antidepressants are commonly used medications and the, um, you know, the, the guidance, the evidence base for treating depression is that if you go on an antidepressant and it works for you and it's your first episode of depression, you should stay on it six months before you come off it. And if you have a recurrence, you should stay on it two years. And that's that's internationally accepted and, and based on evidence. Evidence. Um, so, uh, you know, to, so that there is effective treatment of people with depression, um, then if people respond to these drugs, then they, they should be on them for those sorts of timescales. They're, they're not medicines that really are effective for a month or two months. Um, and uh, and as I said, the 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 study that was done on Scottish prescribing of antidepressants, which I, I, I you know is granted as six years old now, um, did uh, indicate that uh, you know these longer periods of time, which were actually the appropriate lengths of time, were being more applied by GPs because it was new prescriptions of, of antidepressants that were being examined and what happened to those new prescriptions. Can I um, thank the Minister and our officials very much for their evidence. I appreciate that you've done a double shift today. Um, and I think that has been really useful. I suppose we would want to emphasise to, to anyone watching, we recognise the importance of mental health, that there has been huge progress, but also the challenge the petitioners are presenting is that there are issues within that that, that we do need to, to address. We're very grateful for your attendance today and I'm happy for you to remain for the last 10 minutes while we're um, having a conversation about how we take this forward, but I'm also equally happy if you have other commitments that you need to, need to meet. So can I thank you very much for that. Um, we, we now look, need to think again about this petition. I'm assuming that we don't want to close it, but I would be interested in members' views on how we take this forward to Angus? Um, well, I think, Karina, we, we obviously need to reflect on the, the, the evidence that we've heard today. Um, but I'd be keen to, to find out, given uh, what we heard from Dr Mitchell, I'd be here, keen to hear what the BME's current position is uh, with regard to the, the helpline. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, clearly, Dr, Mitch, Dr Mitchell explained that the uh, NHS 24 discussions have highlighted that this, a service is there, but uh, I'd still be keen to hear the BMA's response. Okay. I think, again, perhaps the, the easiest thing to do, or the most effective thing to do, rather, is to get the clerks to reflect on the evidence where we highlighted things we want more information on. I think there's quite a lot around, even the last points that were made by Michelle, around prevalence of, of antidepressants and the length of time people are on. If the contention of the petitioner is that people are on and then not supported, that would be something we would want to explore further. And of course, we would hope that the petitioner um, would again reflect on the evidence and, and if, if she so chose to, to provide more evidence to us. Is that acceptable, sir? Nell Strona? No, I, th I, think that's, I think the important thing is to get the petitioner's response. Um, and then to pick out the individual things that came up during evidence that we, you know, statistics and things that we'd we'd ask for, that would be useful. Okay. I, don't, Michelle. I don't know, I'm permissible on this, but uh, in terms of GPs and hearing from GPs, whether what we're hearing, you know, from both sides, whether there obviously is a gulf um, in the in the evidence and propositions, you know, what their experience of it is, um, mm -hmm. we need to reflect on how we can do that and the extent to which. Mm -hmm. There is a pressure, and whether mm -hmm. we we we've spoken about this in another context altogether, which is defensive practice, uh, where people feel, for the want of something guaranteed, mm -hmm. that they would do this, and you know that would be un perfectly understandable. So it may be again that we'd want to to take that, but I think underneath all of this, we recognise the challenges that health practitioners have mm -hmm. um, in terms of pressure and managing their time and so on as well. The disconnect that many GPs feel now in that that quite often when they're seeing a patient, um, trying to look at them holistically is now 
much more difficult than it was because they used to know them in the context of the society in which they lived and worked. Now, quite often, they only see them as a, as a patient for 10 minutes. They don't know the family, they don't know their mm -hmm. widest circumstances, they don't know how mm -hmm. they live. So it, it's become a much more complicated process. Okay, I think these are useful, but we, if we can ask the clerks to bring that together and obviously any further responses from the petition and others would be welcome in informing our um, further action. But can I again thank the Minister and officials, I'm very much appreciated, and thank all, again all of those who responded to the petition um, and on that basis close the meeting.